right, welcome to AOS Cast 21. It looks like some people were really looking forward to the next episode, so we got a meme here made by Doom and Darkness. Waiting for Haywood's next show, like, does he like pineapple on pizza? And then thinking about my little picture there that Mio Ray drew. What will he say? I've always liked this meme, and being a meme is fun, unless you're the butt of some joke. But even then, sometimes it can be fun. But let's get down to the real important questions. Does he like pineapple on pizza? I've had pineapple on pizza a few times. Once at an expensive place with local fresh ingredients, and uh, it was disgusting. Crust was thin but not crispy. Cheese didn't bake properly near the big chunks of pineapple. No Canadian bacon. It was trash. Another time I had a deep dish version at some cheapo place. I don't know, I think Pizza Hut. And it really hit the spot. I found the fruity thing kind of interesting on this otherwise hot, savory, and cheesy food. I guess different toppings vary from place to place, as do styles, and sometimes using fresh ingredients won't get you where you want to go. Sometimes the cheapness actually enhances the flavor for certain things. Like I don't think Waffle House hash browns would be at all improved by making them organic, locally sourced, and grilling them in peanut allergy safe oil instead of way too much butter. The cigarette burns on their grill they haven't truly cleaned since 97 is just part of the magic. Or maybe pineapple just works on deep dish but not thin crust. Or maybe I was in some kind of mood. I know pineapples don't belong on pizza is a meme, but I don't see how you could feel very strongly about that. I don't like green olives, but I'm not going to tell someone it's not allowed. People put macaroni and gumballs on pizza. Y'all are going to draw the line on pineapple? It reminds me of the New York versus Chicago style pizza debates, where the one guy from New York eventually brings out the old Chicago style isn't even really pizza angle, because the same ingredients are layered in a slightly different order. Hey, they call it pizza? It seems like pizza, so sure it's pizza. Feels like an evasion, if anything. I know Taco Bell has built a business on using the same five ingredients in a different order and calling it something new, but to me it loses sight of what's important. Is it good? Well, sometimes. And general location doesn't much matter to me. I've had horrible pizza in Chicago and horrible pizza in New York. The main thing seems to be that some restaurants are good and some restaurants are not good, and trying to do different things besides. To put it another way, who would win? Jeet Kune Do or Krav Maga? Oh, whichever fighter is more skilled, probably. Hawaiian style is like the drunken boxing of pizza. Flamboyant, goofy, kind of a joke, probably unrealistic, very bad if it's bad, but pretty good if it's good. Bone Reapers came out, and I present to you Bone Chad, who is here to ski the double black diamond and steal your girl. I talked about my initial thoughts on them on Rantcast last week, but so far I'm a big fan. I love the arrogance in their lore, and how it's represented on not just the model, but also his rules. His base is a diorama, like he knows he's the center of attention. He's here, I'll help you out. And rules-wise, you aren't worthy to face him until you've proven yourself against his lackeys. Looks amazing, I like the flavor, the Chinese, Japanese, Persian, Tibetan, a little Egyptian, as, you know, a reimagining of Tomb Kings. Is it a reimagining? I mean, surely that's where they started from, but we ended up in a pretty different and cool place. Also, some guy leaked photos of the Bone Boys book, and GW threw out a community article, because you might as well now, right? For some proper pictures. No potatoes here. Immortus Guard look really cool, good shields, and I really like their helmets. Gothazar Harvester is gigantic and heinous, which is clearly what they're going for. Note that the guy underneath is actually in charge of it, and I feel like, I mean, look at his back here. Doesn't this seem like a corpse cart? Could it be he's this giant storm fiend buff wagon kind of collector unit? Could be pretty sweet. I'm looking forward to seeing his rules. In the background on the left of this major picture, we have Hero on a Horse that looks really cool. I've seen people compare it to Lord Celestant on Dracoth rearing up as well, which is cool. It actually does kind of look like an undead Dracoth, which would fit right in with using twisted parodies of your defeated enemies. Cool. Also, what's this deal with Archon? How come he's in this book? Very interesting. Also, Necro Lounger in the back here is, for some reason, is giving me heavy MGS4 vibes. You know those gecko walkers at the beginning? Here's a meme. <laughs> Also, what's this note at the end here? Is it a note for the editor that they didn't delete by accident? Or a cryptically fun clue? You decide. I hope it's meaningless, actually, because Stormcast sure doesn't need another release. Although I say that, but to be perfectly honest, they really do need a new release. 
I mean, it's no secret their last book was trash. Your battle line and battalion options are so bad, and they're one of those armies like Sylvaneth that are cursed with big, greedy storm hosts slash glades that gobble up all your fun options to give you one ability just good enough to be an offer you can't refuse and then a lunchbox of turds. As for Skaven, here's hoping it's Eshin because they have something to do with the story and I think there's pretty interesting directions they can go with that one. Also, the rules for Gotrek came out, so we can safely say that if anyone ever fought him, they probably got wrecked. Get it? Anyway. Conspicuously missing from his pitch battle profile is the leader role, although this is not without precedent. For instance, Doomseekers and Grimwrath Berserkers are not leaders in Fire Slayers. Though they are heroes to satisfy some synergies, the choice there was to let you run more than six heroes in an army. In Gotrek's case, I imagine it is a little that, but more so a reflection of his unwillingness to be in charge of troops lore-wise, and I think it fits. When I look at his war scroll, I'm reminded of a thought experiment Vince mentioned on one or two of his episodes on game design, when he talked about the importance of power projection. He said, imagine a unit with insane offense and defense. We're talking base war scroll 2-up save ethereal, and buffed witch elf offense, so like 60 damage after saves. But the movement is 1 inch, and it charges only 1d6, and it cannot be teleported. Is this unit good? No. Because power is one thing, but getting that power to where it needs to be is just about more important in an objective-based game like this. I'd almost say that the inverse unit is literally better in Age of Sigmar. A 7 armor save, no combat profile unit, with just insane speed, like 30 inch flying, with run and charge, retreat and charge, and they are allowed to land within three of enemy units. So Gotrek's stats aren't quite to the level of Thought Experiment, but he's also not immobile. And credit where credit is due, he is an absolute unit. Let's go over it. This dude's got 8 wounds, 4 up save, 4 inch move, 10 bravery. 6 attacks, 3s and 3s, rend 2 damage 3, and he's re-rolling all hits and wounds. So quite reliable. He's got Avatar of Grimnir, which if the damage inflicted by an attack, spell, or ability that targets or affects this model is greater than 1, change it to 1. In addition, if a spell or ability would slay this model, this model suffers one mortal wound instead. However, if this model is included in your army, it cannot be set up in reserve, it must be set up on the battlefield. And you cannot use spells or abilities on this model that would allow you to set it up again after the battle has begun, so no teleporting. He's got Crag Black Hammer's Sword of Japan, which allows him to reroll hits and wounds, but also unmodified hits of 6, do a d6 mortal wounds, in addition to normal damage. Unstoppable Battle Fury. At the end of the combat phase of this model is within 3 inches of an enemy unit, it can fight again. Awesome. And by the way, keyword fight means pile in and attack. And he also has the shoulder plate of Adasa, which I think is awesome because they're finally kind of learning that artifacts are so good that unique characters not having them very often makes unique characters not worth taking at all. And so they've given him a 3-up ward against everything, which is awesome. He's 520 points, which is a lot, and he can ally into anything because of his special role, although he's your only ally if that's the case. And it breaks all the ally restrictions except for number of units. So if somehow you had an army that only had two units in it somehow, you couldn't include him because it doesn't break the one per four rule, but it does break the points rule and the ally pool rule. So eight wounds on a four up and then a three up, reducing all damage to one. What's that look like? Well, do the numbers a little bit. You need to throw about 50 non-rending one damage saving throws at him to take him down. And anything more than one damage, uh, you know, you're just wasting a fantastic amount of item budget on that. If it's rend one, you need about 40. If it's rend two, you need about 30, etc. Or 24 mortal wounds, as long as they're one at a time. For damage, he does about 6 to 12 versus armor 4 plus a d6 mortal wounds, and then piles in a second time. However, against ethereal targets, he can switch to crit fissure mode, since his rerolls aren't only failed, but all. And just reroll every non-6 to hit, for a net 1, 2, or 3 d6 mortal wounds, plus a little more than 3 to 6 normal damage versus ethereal 4, or a little more than 0 to 3 versus ethereal 3 up rolling ones, like against Frostlord or Velazada. So yes. On a double pile-in, he will on average kill Frostlord, Velazada, Nagash, the Corn Dragon, whatever monster he wants. He's a monster slayer. But not Marathi, of course. She has god power. And not weak-ass god power like Ilariel, who for being the god of life, sure is easy to kill. Good thing her points went up, she might have become a problem. But what about 30 Hearthguard Berserkers? Not at all. But he'll put a massive dent in them, killing 10 to 20 depending on their buffs. 
His defense is further bolstered by a tiny base that big hordes probably can't fit enough models around to full attack. So he's lining up pretty nicely with Vince's Thought Experiment creature, and with a 4-inch move that you can't teleport or deep strike. Surely everyone has realized his huge downside by now. So how do we deliver him to opponents, or for that matter get him anywhere on the table after deployment at all? As it stands, he's maybe the best stationary bodyguard countercharger ever, although it's a shame he can't fly, so honestly maybe not. But what can we do to have him affect opponents who just stay out of range? Which is very easy for almost every army to do, and seems like the level 1 strat against him. His keywords definitely restrict our tricks greatly, as he's only his name, Duarden, and Order. So no Fire Slayer's abilities, no Dispossessed abilities, etc. It's a shame you can't use the old Sylvaneth Battalions, as Gotrek could fit into the old Iron Bark or Winterleaf ones, that let you add Duarden or Order keyword unit, respectively. But why rub it in further? Comparing the old Sylvaneth Battalions to the new ones is depressing, unless you're willing to just say anything is good. I love the new battalions for the Sylvaneth. As far as spells go, all the cool ones are either setups, keyworded, or both. Same with prayers. One I did find was Seraphon's new spell to give him flying, but no bonus movement, so just not good enough. I think your best option for giving Gotrek some power projection is Deepkin's Iron Rock Enclave, which grants allies the Tides of Death battle trait, so he can run and charge on turn 2, and, as if he needed it, strikes first on turn 3. Due to the required command trait, you can't flip the tides in this enclave for turn 2 high tide, and you have to skip Fuethan, so you only get one run and charge turn, instead of two. That being said, turn 4 retreat and charge would be very welcome on a hero your opponent is going to be bending over backwards to chaff up. A pity he can't fly. This pairs nicely with cogs, of course, because you get the run and the charge, although that's even yet more points and a bit unreliable. But, if anyone wanted an even more elite IDK army, well here you go. As a side note, I've seen a lot of people talk about Bringy Dingy, because Gotrick can't be slain outright so he gets around the cost, but it's a setup, so no dice. As far as increasing his damage or toughness, I think those are exceptional as it is, and just don't need any babysitting. Better to try to shore up his weakness, rather than make him like even more killy or even more immune to damage. <laughs> Comments and questions. About my MWG video, that was way too harsh. You are too technical. Everyone screws up rules from time to time. Obscure rules interactions and FAQ implications? Sure. Abilities printed on War Scrolls, though? Core rules? When you play the game for a living? They play and call it work. It's not even live. They're pre-recorded and edited. To play Age of Sigmar for a living and still be this bad at basic rules and at reading War Scrolls, to me... Like, the only thing I can think of is it belies a certain contempt for the game, which honestly comes out a little bit when they still whinge about fantasy, even four years later. In their position, hearing these same rules mistake complaints for years, you would have to willfully and purposefully be getting rules wrong and consciously avoiding improvement. No one is asking for perfect tournament tactics. It would be unfair to ask for that when their page video explicitly calls their content narrative. But then their Age of Sigmar bat reps are not narrative at all. They have no stories, no backgrounds, no names for anyone, no reasons for fighting. They just show up, play match play, with a stock battle plan, with tons of mistakes. Really basic mistakes that haven't improved after months and years. It's almost like they're using the term narrative as code for playing badly and not by the rules, which strikes me as very dishonest. Actual narrative is a cool way to play, but it still follows the rules, you just change some or make up your own story-driven ones as well, but it's on purpose. When your viewership is so massive and caters to new players and you get early access to GW products, I think you really do have an obligation to at least show proper rules. To show the actual game. Also, if you don't play by the rules, and you don't try to play well, and you build random lists filled with whatever, how are you going to complain about game balance with a straight face? Why say that hordes or monsters or this faction or that faction is OP at all? Moreover, what exactly should GW do about it? How are they supposed to balance the game for people building lists at random and making random decisions during a match? To put it another way, what new rules could they print that would help players who don't really follow the rules? It's like a philosophical question at this point. I know, if you don't like it, don't watch it, fair enough, for a quick evasion. And I admittedly don't, I just used mistakes the comments pointed out, I'm sure there'd have been more if I watched the bat reps legitimately. But my counter might be, when you release something to the public, it might just be criticized, especially if it sucks. 
and I think the proper response to legitimate criticism is to try and improve. They sure have the time, money, and production value too. For instance, I'm reading my notes from a different angle this time, and I think it looks weird. Also, this show's too short, and I talk about pizza for five minutes. In other news, Steve Herner of Holy Hammer fame has finally taken the plunge and started a hobby-focused YouTube channel, despite having reservations, because there are some negative Nancys around the internet, as my last question and answer probably shows. Have no fear, his charity narrative tournaments are awesome. The level of dedication he puts into the hobby is inspiring, and his videos so far have been quite nice, especially for such a new effort. Subscribe immediately if how-tos and narrative hobby are things you're interested in. On the other side of the spectrum, Mr. Mephisto, my sometimes disembodied co-host, has started Rantcast, a soapbox-style live AOS Twitch show with guests. I was on there last week to talk about Ozark Bone Reapers and Magic the Gathering, and this week's guest was Tomb King Tristan. If you like hot takes, playful trolling banter, sports ball references, and sounding more upset than you actually are for fun, follow him on Twitch or Twitter to catch them live or watch later on YouTube. Patreon questions. Edward Lawrence. Edward Lawrence was wondering if I had thoughts on list detuning. In his local group, he is one of the few that know generally what most armies can do, and he builds lists with this in mind. This leads to his problem. While it could be just a Slanesh problem, he's won 7 of his last 8 games by the top of 2, some lists doing less than 6 damage to him in total. They can hardly touch him, so he ends up winning so hard it's not even fun for him. He's now looking at playing different armies, as while he's having social fun, he knows the locals just want to avoid his Slanesh. The tip I have been given so far is don't take synergies or just play cool models, which is not helpful. I agree, it's not helpful. He could not take a keeper and load up on STD, however, that takes him to why bother, I'll just play something else. Enjoying his Slanesh, and he's proud of the hobby he's done there. For casual play, it just leaves him quite disappointed by the activation wars. I hear ya, this is a great question, and one that I don't doubt you struggle with, it's hard. As you say, smashing someone is no fun for you, but more importantly it's no fun for the opponent either. Age of Sigmar is a social game, and matches are just as much cool hangouts as contests of skill, after all. For many people, it's almost more important that both players have fun than to win the game, even for many tournament players. Obviously, the game has victory conditions and you'd like to win, but it feels bad when your opponent didn't even get a chance to play. I see this as a very common misconception for Facebook AOS people who are afraid of tournaments. There really are only like 6 to 12 people at your average 100 player event that are hyper focused on winning first place. Almost everyone else is just there for a good time and hoping to get that 3 and 2 for a winning record. In fact, check out Radio Free Hammerhall's last video on Nova for a good representation of AOS tournament happenings. So I covered one avenue of detuning, or maybe pre-detuning, last show with design restrictions, so watch that one, but let's expand on what I didn't cover about this situation. I've often compared Age of Sigmar to MTG's Commander, in fact I have a little segment on that for Choose Your Army V3, but one of the ways it's similar is that you should have different decks for different social situations. A hard as nails one for when your buddies show up to Eternal Weekend and your force of willing an opponent's turn one thought sees, so you can reanimate Iona on his removal color turn two, only to lose to player three's infinite self mill hermit druid into dread return lab maniac draw card win. But then you want a casual friendly list for when you're playing at the local shop against three people on commander pre-cons straight out of the boxes. How does this apply to AOS specifically though? Do you actually play the coolest looking models? I think this depends on the faction, whether it can. Eidneth Deepkin, ironically, is like the best faction for balancing itself by only playing the coolest looking stuff, because each and every one is trash, <laughs> or too expensive, or both. Eidolon of the Sea General with a Turtle, Volternos, Lotan, 30 Thralls, and 4 Sharks is a very casual list, but features exclusively great looking stuff, depending on your shark bias. I'm not a fan, but your mileage may vary. Also, Volternos can be pretty good, but it's not like everything needs to be weak, right? Other factions may struggle with this, like Fire Slayers, because everything looks the same. I'm just kidding. Magma Droth spam is totally sweet, and a fine alternative to locals bouncing off a brick wall of Hearthguard Berserkers. In your case, Slanesh is sadly in a bad spot, although it feels weird to say that, because normally this would be a great thing and a big success, because the coolest looking stuff is also the most powerful stuff. As it should be. Spamming Keepers, one Epitome, and running or summoning an Enrapturous is all amazing, and they look it, so no dice for Slanesh. This moves us into a common banned restricted list question. Do you tackle the Enabler or the Payoff, the Engine or the Wincon? Again, this depends on faction. 
For the most part, we can consider Allegiance abilities to be engines and powerful units like Morsar Guard or power pairs like Lord Castle and Stardrake as payoffs. In Magic, the answer is usually to ban the engine, because with 20,000 cards, there's always going to be the next best payoff, and more importantly, it can stifle design moving forward because they always have to consider or be afraid of printing some new thing that becomes broken with an existing engine that was barely okay as it is. Similarly, in AOS it's very easy to just not take Morsar Guard in IDK, and then the faction is basically casual friendly in one fell swoop. But if the Allegiance abilities are problematic, as with Slanesh, where even just aggressive summoning is probably NPE in a casual game, much less activation wars on every hero, what is there to do? Keep your lovingly painted keepers on the shelf? Only take two heroes to self-limit your depravity? At what point are you not even really playing Slanesh anymore? Just about the main reasons to play a faction are the cool stuff and their cool abilities and playstyle. When both of those two things are the actual problem, cutting them out leaves you pushing fragile units around that don't look very cool waiting to die without even doing your fun stuff. Can you build a Slanesh list that is more casual friendly? Of course. But it probably features 50% or more new units that you might not own and none of them look the coolest. That's a lot of time and money to build an army you already have that tries to eschew the mechanics that made it fun in the first place. At that point, why not go the extra step and get a new army? One that you can just not take a problem unit or two and still have mechanical fun. This concept is a byproduct of my big problem with Slanesh's design, and the same thing that makes the faction moving forward really hard to balance with points. Besides epitome, nothing is really undercosted here. It's just the allegiance abilities are pushed way too hard, and there are too many that are too strong. Their exploding sixes are already better than Winterleaf, something Sylvaneth has to give up alternatives and options to get. Then their summoning is like Korn's, only light years better, and annoyingly different depending on the wounds your opponent happens to accidentally have access to. Then their activation stuff is on every hero and works every combat, but it's a coin flip, so even harder to balance, because it's generally a blowout one way or another. Also there's built-in counterplay here, but not something the average casual player can be expected to do. Remember the outcry with Legions and Nagash, and those were arguably much easier to play around. There's always the two other options, but I find them equally distasteful. You could play poorly on purpose to give your opponent a chance, but this kind of babysitting is disrespectful, and can be seen as arrogant or insulting at worst. Like if my opponent is actively trying not to win, what are we even doing, you know? We're just pushing G.I. Joes around for no reason. Secondly, you could play points down, so 1800 points versus 2k or some such, but this touches on those same negative notes I mentioned before, and it brings to mind a globetrotter dunking on generals with one hand behind his back kind of thing. Not a good look. I think keeping it to one keeper and no chariot heroes if you want to tough it out, or go with a different faction, which surely isn't the answer you wanted to hear, but I think our hands are tied on this one. Bummer. Special thanks to Bjarni, Carl Martin Rosenberg, Carson Blake Phipps, Chaos Spawn, Charles Faduk, Des Brennan, Doom and Darkness, Dr. Hank, Dwight Crow, Edward Lawrence, Eric, Erda, Wanderer, Greg Dykus from the Sigmar and Sun podcast. Thanks a bunch. I'll have to come back on there sometime. Henners, Jacob Graham, Jens Nielsen, Jimmy Starr, Kevin Harkham, Kyle Zmerchik, Marcus, Martin Orlando, aka Good Painter Stormcast Man, Matthew Davies, Michael Derazinski, Miguel Cabezas, Marie Gank, Nosh, Perna, Richard Rossman, Rob Nelson, Sean, Steve Pegg, Vincent Wright, Tyler Emerson, Chris Hollett, Das Ox, Lottel, Peter Atkinson, Daniel Rose, Warbound, and of course Windigo. In response to a bunch of comments I've gotten on Patreon and DMs, I think I'm going to have to agree with you guys. I think you're right. Originally I wanted Choose Your Army to be this one-stop shop where it's just this giant video document where you just watch the whole thing and it tells you everything you need to know about just about every playable army so people didn't have to click through a whole bunch of videos to find their stuff. But honestly, with the release schedule that AOS is doing, it means I have to delay the video like essentially forever if I'm waiting on new releases, and that's just not ideal. There's like six or seven armies in Choose Your Army V2 who have had enough changes that they just need new sections entirely, and I don't want the old video to be outdated for too much longer. So I think I'm going to cave, and I'm going to do smaller videos where it's possibly a faction per video or a Grand Alliance per video, really just so the content can be as current as possible. I don't want, for instance, the Night Haunt section to be up for too much longer because the information in there is just kind of wrong after the changes. 
and new players are going to read that and be like, oh, Night Haunt aren't very good, I'll choose something else. Well, that's not the case, right? So anyway, look forward to seeing, I think I might just release them regularly and then put them in their own playlist called Choosing Your Army Current State of Age of Sigmar or something like that. Um, so good idea, guys. I think you're right. And expect those in the near future to start rolling out. Thanks for watching.